God's essence to his is to be looked at closely. By affirming this, you release the mind from overvaluating its own learning device and restore the mind to its true position as the learner. Well, that learning device, guess what that is? The body. The body. It's, it's more than a feather. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's highly overrated. Mm -hmm. Look at the skills the body has. Look at all these things. I've spent years developing these, these skills. And the mind is the learner. Bodies don't learn. Minds learn. And that in this world, it doesn't always seem that way. It seems like when you work on a golf stroke or a tennis stroke, it can seem as if it somehow is in the in the body and in the brain, you know, at times. But again, the body's just a learning device. Okay, what does it mean from over evaluating? Raising it up, making it more than it is. But evaluating to me means analyzing it. Eva evaluating value, mm -hmm. the word value. So this is talking about putting value on it then. By oh, over evaluating. Okay, not evaluating. Yeah. Okay. We had a whole discussion last night about I got the little pen and a pencil and I, I was saying the body is kind of like a pencil. And, you know, I went through the whole deal about saying, you know, as if you took a test and, and said, well, the reason I flunked this test was because you did a terrible job, you know. Get better than, I'll do better on the test. It would seem foolish to blame a pencil or a pen for failing a multiple choice test. Or to come in and congratulate the yes. pen. If you did well. Right. And, and yet, that's exactly what happens when the body and its skills and seeming abilities are raised up as if they're real important. Or criticized. Or criticized. So that's what's meaning by evaluating. Yeah. That's, that seems to be a biggie. Again, there's no order of difficulty, but as we're looking at things, those are the things that probably start to, to surface. Like, I worked long and hard. Jesus, <laughs> to develop <laughs> this belly or that ability or, you know, something to do with the body. And again, bodies don't learn lessons. Minds learn lessons. Even from reincarnational perspective where they talk about incarnations, you know, you, you pick it up, you lay it down. You pick it up, you lay it down. You know, you use the body. But what is that which uses? The body is just a device for learning. It's not not the thing that is learning. The mind is learning. So again, this is very subtle, but I've had people work with the course and they'll say, Well, I'm gonna stay I'm gonna stay in my particular job because that's my classroom and I'm I'm not going to leave this job until I come to peace because it's my classroom. Or a, a, a defense could be used for the ego to say, I'm a mother, and that's my classroom. And I could get that lesson in that classroom. Because I want that classroom. Right, you see, that's, I, why. that's what's underneath it. So I'm not going to leave that classroom because I need to get the, get the lesson in that classroom. But that, that's still seeing it as if I'm a person in the classroom. And when one seems to be guided to move on, again, it would be coming from a place of saying, yes, this, the mind is really the classroom. Right mind is one lesson of the classroom, and wrong mind is another lesson. And which lesson am I going to learn? It doesn't, it takes the emphasis upon, off the body, being in a specific setting. Because the body and the setting are both on the screen. <laughs> and the mind is the learner, and the mind is worth the lesson. So once you, if you just keep that clear, then you don't get into all this trying to twist and distort things like you're saying so that you can hang on to something specific that you like. And nothing in the world is the teacher. The world is not the teacher. Mm -hmm. The teacher is either the Holy Spirit or the ego, depending on which one I choose as teacher. Mm -hmm. Coming through relationship, is that what you're saying? So why would it matter whether you were at home with children or whether you were in a job or or where you were, if you were open-minded, right-minded, it seems like you could learn anywhere. The, the, the circumstance wouldn't matter. 
Well, again, there's a lot of assumptions in your statement. Like, you're, you're talking about right-mindedness, and then you're saying, why would it matter if you were in this circumstance or in that circumstance? But you see, the mind is an in-circumstance. It, it has concepts. For instance, if it believed it was a mother, that's a concept. Okay. That has to be questioned. The right mind is, is free of the concept. So, again, that's the thing that goes on a lot of times. People will say, it doesn't matter. You can still be a an American and wake up. You can still be a mother and wake up. You can still be a man or a woman and wake up. You know, you can still be a chief executive officer of a corporation and wake up. Well, <laughs> when you really start to follow it in, those are concepts that have to be unlearned because the mind isn't in those things. Those are concepts that it has made up. It believes that it's... Oh, it's one of those. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. See oh, how that, that's yeah. wrong-mindedness to believe you, you, are, you are in, in a situation. Yes. To identify with any one of those things that David named yes. would be not to wake up would be to be wrong-minded. That was a question asked of, I think, Emmanuel one time, channeled through him, and, and they said, how, I want to achieve enlightenment, but how will I achieve enlightenment and remain as chief executive officer of this corporation? And Emmanuel just said, you won't. <laughs> just kind of real, real direct, you know, just beat around the bush. And that's the same kind of thing we're saying, except we're, instead of just saying you won't, we're just looking at the metaphysics mm -hmm. of how it would be impossible to conceive of yourself in a, in a small role mm -hmm. and be negative. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And once, once the mind steps back from that and no longer identifies with the role, then it couldn't play the game as if it still identified with the role. It couldn't pretend that it did when it didn't. Mm -hmm. That would be a lack of integrity and would not be the honesty yeah. that's characteristic of a teacher of God. But wasn't there a part almost that you almost need to do basically what you've done and extricate yourself from those attachments on some level, maybe not necessarily physical, maybe, but that yeah, might be it's either not way. It's, it's but not informed. It's, it's all in the mind. Yeah. It's but, but I'm I'm just saying. Yeah. Right. To be more honest with yourself is would be to extricate yourself from those circumstances or not. It wouldn't be the circumstances. It would it would be the the, the beliefs. Right, believe. And then what would it happen? How do you know you're doing that, though, if you're still playing those roles? How do you know you're not deceiving yourself, like you're saying? There was like a... <laughs> and again, even that way, it wouldn't yeah. be a sense of playing the role. Right. It, was, it could be perceived all kinds of ways. I mean, yeah. Jesus was perceived in, in many ways. Yeah. But again, we're coming to that in, internal kind of sense of being, mm -hmm. of having questioned all the roles and concepts and taken on one concept. Forgiveness is, is one box instead of, well, I'm wearing many hats here. I'm a wife, and I'm a, I work here, and I do this, and I'm, oh, in church, I'm a, a deacon, mm -hmm. and I'm a, a Republican, and I'm, you know. American? <laughs> yeah, all these mm -hmm. things over here, mm -hmm. it's like saying, well, I'm going to trade in all these boxes and all these different hats, so to speak, for forgiveness. I see where your question is going because there will seem to be changes on the screen that will automatically come sure. when that happens. Mm -hmm. It would it would be a scam to try to to try and hold on to all those things. I mean, mm -hmm. how could you put put energy say you're a real devoted politician or you know politically involved mm -hmm. in something? You know, because you have to weigh that against. Mm -hmm. And then how could you give that relevance? Yeah. I mean, just be. Symbolically, in my life, or in the life of David, again, to get back to that story, the life of David, it was I, when I was seemed to be in graduate school and everything, and, and was, had questioned all these disciplines and was questioning the concept of education and everything else, that it got to be a point where I was like, when I was, I was 
seeing me on the game. And I was, like, writing the exam, and it was, like, more difficult to put down the answers that I thought someone else wanted to hear. I started to more and more to put down the answers, and it got to be a point where it was like, well, I'm, I've questioned the system now, and I don't know how I'm to be used, but I can't continue to perceive myself in the system. And it wasn't like you bolted. And you said, I feel, you know, it seems appropriate I should be in school, but because I'm being called, I'm going to leave. You were feeling a discomfort with being in school. It was like you were being called, and it wasn't making sense anymore to write those answers on exams. It's that whole thing of seeing, when you start to see beyond something, then you can't go back up there above those underlying assumptions. Try to be something you're not. And try to be something you're not. I tried Mm -hmm. to fit the round peg into the square hole for a long time, and I said, this is nuts. And the little voice inside was saying, right, come on, keep coming back, <laughs> come to me. And so that's just another one of those examples. Mm-hmm. And I think all of us have had, mm-hmm. that's not a unique experience, we've all had that in certain things, whether it just seemed to be relationships or, you know, in certain things where it's just not felt con- For me, what felt natural to do was to drop all activities, because I was in social activities. Monday night, every Monday night for 20 years, I played mahjong with the girls. We'd go, we'd eat, we'd talk, we'd chat, and the chatting was because it wasn't what I wanted to chat about. I would have loved to have gone deeper. That was irrelevant to them, and it would have been arrogant to even try in that situation. So it just felt comfortable to get out of a situation I'd been in for 20 years. And bunko, you know, another social situation. And then it became contracts that I thought I needed and and everything. I, you know, it was dropping everything off my calendar. And I'm just beginning to just pick up and leave to go to a trailer or leave to come here, you know, and leave the family. And uh, with some wondering about why I'm leaving again, with the answer of saying, I'm being called. This is something I have to do, you know. So, but those things aren't, they're not feeling uncomfortable. They're feeling very appropriate. And um, there's no conflict there about leaving those things. Now, the people around, all those people around, there's lots of conflict going on. They think I've gone over to the end. They're very worried about me, very concerned. You know, my brother at 2 o'clock in the morning the other night took my face and just went, be merry for a minute, be merry. He was shaking me. And I'm just looking at him, you know, and I'm going, oh, my God, this is what everybody's wanting. You know, so it's it there out uh, there. There's discomfort, but it's not. That's not my discomfort. You know. So. Beck, I think you know what you were. What I heard, at least, that you were beginning to say to Rhonda about um, maybe making some kind of move that would allow the time and space mm-hmm. to really examine. Right. And and I think there's something to that. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's symbolic. Mm-hmm. Granted that it's symbolic. And it's symbolic of the mind's willingness mm-hmm. to really dedicate itself and to really put the attention mm-hmm. where it really wants it to be. Mm-hmm. And there's no sense of dependency. In other words, no. with in Rhonda's case, moving to Cincinnati, you know, isn't that isn't the, the utopia or the, the place that you need to go, you know, or whatever. There is no place, but again, it's symbolic, as Beverly is just saying, of that willingness. It seems to be taking the form of the bodies sitting around meditating and going into things, and at least in the worldly eyes, that's what it may look like or could be interpreted as. But as you're talking about, the branching of the road is... <laughs> It's not that, it's just what it seems to look like on the outside. And, and that's the important thing, is getting clear of but the it mind. it sounds like you're saying you do have to give up these other things, you know, jobs and uh, seeing yourself as a mother or a wife or a, a daughter, whatever, and and go apart. Yeah, um, I think you're saying to give up your... Uh, attachments to those concepts. So if if you hadn't felt you needed to go somewhere else, you could you might have done that in Prairie City. Oh, yeah. Living in your